Hello and welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast is not sponsored by, but uh, I am going to bring up the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, which is a conference that is happening in Vancouver, November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of this year, 2019. And I'm bringing it up because I will be there, and I'm excited to be there uh, as a speaker this year, which is pretty exciting. And uh, if you're going to be around BC, I find... uh, I find this to be an excellent conference. It's one of my favorite psychedelic conferences I've been at throughout all the ones I've been to around the world, and uh, it's great to be there, so please come out. If you follow the link that is contained in the show notes to this episode, um, well, you would be able to buy your ticket through an affiliate link, which will also make me a little bit of money, which is great because I will be traveling to BC uh, to participate in this conference. And you also coming and buying it through the link allows me to have a little bit of offset on the expenses to be there. So thanks for doing that. I will be in other places in the world, including England for breaking convention and Australia for a collection of different speaking opportunities. Details on all of that are at jameswgesso.com forward slash events. Come check me out. Out. Yeah, come check me out. All right, so into today's episode, which is with Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Dr. Andrew Gallimore, neurobiologist, chemist, and pharmacologist interested in the relationship between psychedelic drugs, the brain, consciousness, and the structure of reality, is currently based at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. He is also the author of this book. Uh, which I am holding up for you if you're watching it on uh, YouTube, but it is called Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies, and the Cosmic Game. He's got a heavy focus on DMT, and in particular on the meaning of DMT, the meaning of life even, um, and what the DMT experience shows us about the structure of reality and talking there about entities and hyperdimensional realities. He's got a model for this. He's got a computational neurobiological model for the structure of reality and where DMT takes us, which is a place that it takes us to when we smoke it. He was also one of the people who uh, helped design the extended state DMT protocol along with Rick Strassman, which is going to be starting experiments, as far as I understand, in England um, through Imperial College if I am correct, at some point in time this year or next year. Um, but yeah, so he is an interesting, interesting character. This book is, I haven't read it, to be to be blatantly honest. I just got it. Um, it is really a work of art on the inside. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a beautiful pressing. Um, and it's an interesting topic. Now, I had initially recorded this not that long ago, and inside scoop uh, for listeners, sometimes interviews take months from when recorded to being released and normally they go in a pretty much chronological order from when recorded you know like who gets who gets released um, is in accordance to when it was recorded uh, with the caveat of doing my absolute best to sort of like space out representation between men and women and people of of differing um ethnic backgrounds than Caucasian. Um, Although it's kind of difficult to do. So sadly, at this point, it's like 50% Caucasian males, 50% everyone else as best I can. But as the psychedelic uh, scene starts to diversify, I feel happy about uh, the opportunity to represent a greater diversity of perspective, as well as a greater diversity of the other components that eventually come into some sort of (laughs) social identity. Um, Anyway, so Gallimore is getting fast-tracked, and he's getting fast-tracked because it seems like his book is really relevant right now. There's a lot of talk around it, and I want this conversation to land into that larger conversation. What really sort of sparked this, hey, let's do this now, was actually a uh, review and critique that was put out by Cypress UK that was written by a philosopher, Dr. Peter Schurstick. Cage. Peter, I really hope I pronounced that well. Thank you for sending me the, the uh, pronunciation on Twitter. I hope I didn't butcher it. But anyways, it was a great critique, very interesting stuff. Um, and I really enjoyed this interview with Andrew as well. So I figure it makes sense. I'm just going to drop it now. I think you're going to enjoy 
Of course, I'll put links to everything in the show notes to this episode you can learn so you can learn more about um, Dr. Gallimore's book. I'll also put a link to this critique, actually, because it was uh, it's quite good. And of course, if you don't know about Cypress UK, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'll, that'll work as like a double off to, you know, outer linking the larger network of awesome people representing varieties of perspective just through one link. It's really, it's wild. Um, so yeah, that is the intro. But of course, let's just take a quick second. I want to give a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon, especially people whose names are listed on the screen here people who give quite significantly and have some of them having been for a very long time, as you heard in the uh, very long intro for episode 100. Um, And their names are also listed in the description to this episode, wherever you're listening to it um, as an added thanks. Big thanks to all of my patrons though, because even if you're giving just the equivalent of a cup of coffee, it all adds up into something that enables me the capacity to invest in this long term and uh, with fairly reliable steady income, which is super great. So huge thanks to them. And if you're not already a patron, please become one. That would be great. You can do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso, different levels of pledge get different stuff, which is kind of cool, including access to... So go check that out. You could also buy t-shirts, art, copies of my book, ebooks, physical books, that kind of stuff on jameswjessa.com forward slash shop. You could also just drop me a PayPal donation. All of those slash any of those are great. Anything is something. Thank you very much. Here's my interview with Dr. Andrew Gallimore on Adventures Through the Mind. Dr. Andrew Gallimore, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for reaching out, actually. At first, I was like, your email came, and I'm like, oh, I have so much going on. I can't think about anything else. And then eventually, it came back, and it landed at this perfect moment. I'm like, okay, let's take a look. And I'm like, oh, shit. All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's have this conversation. This will be fun. Um, I uh, Yeah, I just watched your uh, – it was like a two-hour lecture you gave for um, – I'm not sure who you were giving it for, but it looked like you're on the West Coast of the United States. Psychedelics Today was associated uh, to the lecture, and it was about the, uh, I guess, like computational information theory or something around how yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was an excellent yeah, lecture. Was, thank you. That was in Boulder. Um, yeah. So this was a psychedelic shine. They they invited me. There's a there's a group there, medicinal mindfulness, who are basically trying to uh, implement this extended state. DMT infusion technology that I developed with Rick Strassman. And so I happened to be over in the United States. And so they, they invited me to give a, uh, a lecture, uh, which I, I duly did. And um, yeah, it was my first time in Boulder, uh, first time to lecture in the United States. And um, it was a wonderful experience, to say the least. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it offers a fairly complex and thorough breakdown of this I don't know, inf- information model for reality and how that comes yeah. into play. And so far as the neurobiologies of perception, although you didn't touch on consciousness, you mm-hmm. said you intentionally uh, avoided it. Yes. Um, but uh, so, you know, in, in lieu of explaining that, since we only have, you know, an hour and I want to get to a lot of places, I'm going to ask you a pretty big question uh, to start okay. us off, which is what is reality? Okay. Yeah. Very big question. Well, I see fundamentally reality. Well, okay. It's a big question because it depends what you mean by reality, of course. Right. Um, if you, if you mean what is reality, what is the world we experience fundamentally, that is information. I see reality as being fundamentally an, an, an information based structure. Um, and I see your, your personal reality of course is I believe, a very, very thin lower dimensional slice of a much higher dimensional system. And that word system is also quite vague, and that's also kind of uh, deliberate. Um, but I see you, you're, what we know about the structure of the world, when you look d- deeply at the, the fundamental structure of reality, it, it reveals itself to be structured fundamentally from information and you know, what is information? That's another question. Um, but this also applies to the world that you experience. And this, this, this is something that we can, um, you know, whilst getting at the kind of the ground of the fundamental ground of reality is quite difficult. 
um, there are things you can you can open your eyes and see a world that is constructed from information. So, for example, if you open your eyes now and you look at the world, you will see a world that is uh, very very rich in information. The the the, um, the boundaries between objects, the texture of, of objects, the shapes, the colors, um, the distances, the relationships between objects. All of this is information. We know it's information because we know that it's represented uh, in the patterns of information that are generated by your brain. And you can demonstrate this relatively easily. Um, I, the most straightforward way would be look at the medical literature. Look at people who've, who've had strokes. Um, there, there are um, some fairly unfortunate people who have strokes that affect certain parts of the brain specifically. And these are actually provide very good case studies. So for example, if you have a stroke that affects a part of the back of the brain, a part of the visual area of the brain called uh, V4, for example, this is the part of the brain that represents color information. People who have a stroke that specifically affects that part of the brain wake up in a world when they recover in a world that um, is devoid of color. They wake up in a monochrome world. Mm. So that, that, that aspect of the world is gone. Um, similarly, if you have a stroke that affects a part of the brain that represents uh, movement information, then you, um, this is quite more difficult to comprehend, but you actually experience a world of, of still images. Hmm. Um, which is kind of hard to imagine, right? Yeah, really. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, the movement in the world and the way things, the sort of the dynamics of your visual world seem so obvious um, that you lose sight of the fact that all of this is being represented within the brain. And if you lose that, then um, you actually can exist. It's called achinotopsia, um, the uh, lack of movement in your visual world. Um, so, so whatever level you look at reality, uh, you always see that it's constructed from information. Uh, and this information can be extremely complex at, at high levels. So the, the, the information generated by your brain, your personal subjective reality, for example, uh, or you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and down to the ground of reality, uh, which uh, more and more, uh, even more kind of mainstream physicists now start to be, uh, believe that actually has a fundamentally informational type of structure. There is a fundamental unit of reality that is something something kind of digital that exists in a, a small number of states kind of like the the binary digits uh, of computer code which exist in only two states but from which um massive amounts of highly complex information can be generated are you um, talking about uh and in part, part in the <clears throat> what might be really plebe type language but are you, are you talking about sort of the quantum level of reality when you're when you're saying like the ground of reality i'm talking deeper than that i'm talking mm. more fundamental than that i mean this is i mean once you get into this kind of area you're in you're in the realm of, of somewhat of speculation and of, of competing kind of ideas about what's going on um but the idea that fundamentally information sits at the ground of the reality is actually fairly mainstream now Hmm. Physicists will argue about, well, is it is it kind of a digital structure or is it more um, sort of like quantum information? Is it like qubits or something like that at the ground of reality? Uh, but I think, you know, we have to go very, very deep for that. So um, so whichever way you, way you look at reality, you will always find that, it, that it's structured from information and that what the reality that we experience is this layered uh, complexification of information of many 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 layers in this kind of organizational hierarchy um, and our brain and our conscious subjective world kind of sits at the top of that mm -hmm. however um, you know what what DMT for example demonstrates actually and actually I get a lot of insights in, into this kind of structure uh, through use of DMT it kind of re reinforces some of these intuitions uh, over the years uh, and what DMT actually shows you is that this this very kind of parochial thin slice of reality, which is our kind of normal waking subjective world is indeed just a lower dimensional slice of something much more high dimensional that somehow 
DMT kind of gates access to this kind of higher dimensional space, which is experienced as this DMT world. Okay, well let's 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 hang mm. on that because that's that's yeah, ju- yeah. that's jumping ahead. I want to I want to get there, but I want to I want to lay a little bit more of a firm. Mm. Uh, I want to get down to the information layer a little bit more consistently before we get up into the complexity. Um, so what you're, I mean, I'm trying to reiterate this for my own understanding and possibly for the listeners as well. Uh, you know, what you're saying is like all of reality is information and our personal subjective reality is the um, complex representation of this information formed into the human brain or mm-hmm. looking like the human brain, interpreting some sort of complex of bo- of information that is then represented as models in our subjective experiences processed by the central unit of the brain. So everything we experience is a model in our head. Yes, exactly. So the the world you experience, uh, the world you experience under all circumstances is constructed from information. What's special, and this is something we don't really understand, uh, what's special about the information that, that the brain generates is that it has this property of subjectivity. Um, so that it feels like something to to experience this information. That's kind of a strange way of putting it, but that's really the, one of the only ways you can put it. You know, there's something it's like to ex- to experience this information, and 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 this is what's some in a way it makes it quite difficult to get your head around in in quite a literal sense almost. Is that um, you, the world that you are experiencing is that information being generated by your brain, but kind of from within. You're experiencing it from the within, um, rather than looking at the brain from the outside. And that um, and that 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 processing, and mm-hmm. the brain and the self, all of that is yeah. also some sort of rendering of reality, uh, yes. of information. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. So, so what the brain is doing is it's, uh, and this uh, this always applies. Of course, this is this is true whether you are awake or whether you are dream. Whenever you are conscious and having an experience, uh, whenever your brain uh, is constructing a world, that's basically what the brain is doing. The brain is a world builder. The brain uses information to construct um, your world. And um, wh- whenever you are conscious and having an experience, your brain is constructing that world from information. And that's true whether you are awake or whether you are dreaming. Uh, your brain constructs the world in exactly the same way when you are dreaming um, as it does when you are awake. And that's fairly well understood now. Uh, like, and like, the, the, like the construction process, not the end result of, of like what – because like dreaming is very different than – being awake consistency and novelty for example are different different levels but the actual process of constructing a subjective reality is the same process based on different input output stuff right exactly so so the 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 key difference between dreaming and uh waking and this has been studied quite extensively by uh, sort of dream phenomenologists a rare group of kind of uh, psychologists that are interested in, you know, what is the difference? What are the differences between the wake state and the dream state? Um, And when you actually analyze the dream state, what you notice is that um, it's actually almost continuous with waking in the sense that the amount of time you spend talking on the telephone, the amount of proportion of time in your day you spend watching TV or doing other kind of mundane activities is actually the same when you're dreaming as it is when you're awake surprisingly. Hmm. Now, what you say, though, is quite correct in that there, there's more kind of novel, novelty and fluidity and unpredictability in the dream. And that's because when you're awake, although your world is always constructed from this uh, information being generated by your rain, brain, sorry, it's being modulated and kind of uh, restra- constrained by small amounts of information from the external world. Um, so this is sensory information, in other words, information via the eyes and the ears and the touch, etc. This is um, it's called extrinsic sensory information, and this basically controls and directs the construction of the world by your brain. When you're dreaming, um, for various reasons, that information is cut off, uh, basically to keep you asleep, um, to stop you acting out your dreams and that kind of thing. But basically, um, so so the brain is still building the world in the same way. And it's the same information, in fact. Uh, the difference, however, 
uh, is that it's not being constrained and controlled by this sensory information. This is why the dream world can become more fluid and can kind of shift from scene to scene uh, because the brain is not being guided as much. But it is building the world in the same way. It's building the world from the same kind of information. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I hope I'm not sort of losing the plot and jumping around too much here. I'm sure the listeners will be able to tell if that's the case. Uh, but if everything's a model in our head, then, you know, what, what makes reality real? Like, is there something like what makes, what makes the fact that I'm knocking on my desk, like that that's a desk that's consistently a desk, you know, what, what is, is nothing real? Like, I, I, I'm not sure how to formulate this question. Like, I understand that, that, uh, all of this is information okay, on some level, mm -hmm. and that the manner in which I'm experiencing it and the consistency and continuity of my experience and the supposed objectivity of that experience, you know, by way of sort of a mutual validation across across multiple peoples and across time, you know, um, that, that those are not necessarily reality at its core or at its most fundamental, but more like, um, and I think the guy I got this from, uh, his last name was Hoffman or Hofstetter maybe, that it's more like the way when I navigate the screen on my computer and I'm moving yeah. files around and I'm opening windows and all this stuff. That's not actually what's happening. What's happening is it's bits of information moving around, but the but the desktop, the operating system is a, is a model which gives me an adaptive capacity to move information around in a way that uh, in a way that you know is is functional to my needs, um, and so I'm assuming exactly that's right, that's yeah. pretty similar to what you're talking about insofar as the models of reality. But then my question is, if that's the case, like, is there like what what makes reality real? Yeah. So you're 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 that's you're, you're absolutely spot on. That's a very good description of what's going on. So this is Don Hoffman you're talking about, yeah. Donald Hoffman, yeah. who's actually one of my kind of favorite scientists. I love his way of thinking about things. And 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 yes. Yeah, so reality is a model, and and as you say, it's an adaptive model. It's the model that works the best. Um, and all models, all whenever you, ex in a sense, I would say, all models of reality are equally real. If you're having an experience. Um, if you're conscious, then that is reality, uh, and it's real in the same in the way that it, it, its reality can never be denied. If you um, if you experience a world and you let's say you're a schizophrenic, um, so what you might ask so a schizophrenic might experience a completely different type of reality to me. Is his or her reality less real than mine? And the kind of intuitive response is to say, well, yes, of course, they're experiencing a distortion, a distortion of reality or the, you know, an incorrect version of reality. You just froze there for a second. Um, so the last thing you were saying was uh, you were talking about the schizophrenic and you were saying that yeah. you would say, yes, you know, that's a distortion of reality. Yeah. OK. So, yeah. So a, a schizophrenic will ex experience a very different world. They will describe a very different world. Um, and it's a kind of a natural response to say, well, the schizophrenic's world, the, the kind of fragmented, distorted version of reality is, is a less real version of reality. It's less true. Uh, but if you're going to say that somebody else's version of reality is less true, then you better have a very good handle uh, on what defines a true reality. What is the real thing when it comes to reality? Mm. And we know um, as you've just explained very well, um, that the brain has no handle on truth. There's no yardstick for truth in terms of um, subjective experience, in terms of the reality that your brain constructs. All the brain does, it knows that this model of reality works, um, whereas this model of reality perhaps is less adaptive, it's less functional. So what we can say uh, is that this model of reality is the most adaptive model of reality, and so this is a slightly less adaptive model of reality. What we can't say is that this model of reality is more real and more true than this one. So what that means, and this is fundamental, uh, is that a schizophrenic's version of reality is equally real, but so then, it's less adaptive. So it's equally real. It's as real as your reality is to you, yes. 
Yes. All realities are subjective to an extent, right? Um, you know, the only thing you can never deny is your own, is your own consciousness, is your own, the, own, the world that you're experiencing. Um, and, and this applies also to a, uh, someone who's having a, a psychedelic trip. If you're on, on a high dose of psilocybin mushrooms, for example, your world changes dramatically. It goes from being kind of stable and predictable um, to being unstable, unpredictable, fluid, and novel. Um, is that a distortion of reality? Um, or is that simply a altered version of reality, perhaps less adaptive version of reality, but perhaps a, a richer version of reality, containing perhaps more information? Hmm. So one could argue uh, if the kind of fairly well accepted hypotheses regarding psychedelic drug action in that they reduce the filtering capacity of the brain, they allow the brain to absorb more information from the environment, um, perhaps that's a more real version of reality because you're getting more information from the environment. Um, and well, then let's, you let's, have... let's pause here for a second because I want to go back <laughs> yeah. to this. I'm feeling like, I'm kind of feeling like, uh, like the ground is being taken from beneath my feet in a way. Not, not really, but I mean like in the sense that it's like, so you're making this proposition, understandably so, that everyone's subjective reality is equally as real as every other subjective reality. And yet you're also saying that there's a particular sort of, um, we'll say, canon of reality that is adaptive and we call it objective. And and I'm wondering, like, does it not make sense? I mean, what's the like, isn't science, for example, the, the very thing that you practice about trying to like funnel and accumulate things into this canon of objective reality, does it not make sense to set some sort of a yardstick? I know you said that the brain doesn't have a yardstick for truth, but as a species, does it not make sense to set some sort of yardstick um, down to figure out like what what is, and to say like, this is what's real, and to be able to yes. then utilize that to differentiate between real and hallucination? I mean, maybe just mm. adaptively, but mm. um, I mean, adaptive, I'd say is a pretty goddamn important thing for us to be given that, I mean, most of us are fairly, you know, invested in maintaining our individual and collective aliveness, you know, um, like, does it not make sense to be able to like have some sort of, you know, established agreed upon model to, uh, you know, to differentiate between what's real and what's a hallucination? Um, yeah, absolutely. And but th this, of course, is a convention, and it's a very important convention. But you mustn't lose sight of the fact that it is a convention. It's a convention to say that this is. Uh, I mean, we all accept that you know certain things. If 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 I see something, um, you know, if I'm driving my car and I see a figure in the in the middle of the road, and and then I kind of drive straight through it, I would accept as anyone else that I, it was some kind, perhaps some kind of hallucination. Um, some people might say it was a ghost. Uh, but it, it it was just as real in terms of, of my subjective experience. It was it was uh, the re the experience itself was real, of course. Um, the, the the difference is how what's going on in my subjective world, the information being generated by my brain, actually relates to the information being generated outside my brain, and that's really what what we're talking about. Um, there is for when you. When your world changes, let's say when you are when you become psychotic or when you uh, take a, a psychedelic drug, I'm not saying that they're the same thing at all. Mm -hmm. um, but um, your world changes, and more importantly, um, or as importantly, the relationship between what's going on um, in the brain, the information, the relationship, the mapping, if you like, between the information being generated by your brain, which is experienced as your subjective world, and the information being generated outside your brain, what we would call the external world, the environment, changes. Um, and that could be uh, an adaptive change, or it can be a non-adaptive change, or it could all even mean that information is generated in the brain uh, that has no relationship to the external world, uh, which is... Um, what you might call a, a true hallucination when you see something that there's there's n that there's no relationship whatsoever to whatever's going on outside then right, we like say, donald duck is uh, to my left right exactly yeah 
so that would be a, that would be a true hallucination. So 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 I think you have to be careful. I mean, it's quite a slippery subject when you talk about you know what is reality, and and um, I think you knew that when you asked the question, right? Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what is real? So what? So when I say all worlds are equally real, um, I mean in terms of um, the in, in in the terms of they're all generated from the same information. Um, what what makes a world? What could make a world? You could perhaps justifiably say a world less real is if it has no relationship to what's going on outside. Um, then you would, you might say that this this is um, perhaps less real. I, I don't really like that term, but you would say that it it, it has um it has less predictive value. It has less adaptive value. It, it doesn't relate to actually what's going on outside. Um, the brain, mm -hmm. um, but all worlds are equally real, and that all worlds are constructed. All subjective worlds, phenomenal worlds, we call them, uh, are, are are constructed from information, and that's always the case, whether it's a normal world or whether it's a you know a DMT elf world, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I personally think it's it's important, you know, to keep a <laughs> open mind about this to some degree, right? Because otherwise, you can go into the hard line reduction materialism sort of di like dysfunctional physicalism i don't want to make any hard you know negative statements about those mm -hmm. positions because each one serves a i think serves a role in the larger understanding of life that we humans are you know accumulating over time uh but it's easy to get locked into a certain paradigm <clears throat> excuse me you know maybe it's physicalism maybe it's uh socialism maybe it's capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get locked in and believe this is the only way it can be and that that's not entirely true. And it makes sense for us to have some sort of grounding, some sort of compass that allows us to differentiate between, you know, what is a model in our head that is adaptive and, and, um, and uh, you know, primarily referenced by the external world and what is entirely a con like a construct of our internal world perceived as being outside of us or something so that we can yeah. better navigate ourselves in a, in a healthy and functional way. Um, yeah, I think it's important to have both of those factors in play. I think it's essential because if when people, particularly if you're trying to discuss, for example, people say to you, uh, like say to me, are the these DMT entities real? Is the DMT world real? And and it's it's unless you actually kind of define your terms and actually, you know, what question are we really trying to answer here? And 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 people will normally say, well, is it is it is it real or is it all in your head? And I have to explain to them that worlds experienced subjective worlds are always in your head. They're always built from information generated by a brain. The question we, we need to ask is not is the world built in your head, because it always is. The question is, is that world being modulated and constrained by some kind of sensory information from outside the brain? That would be normally how we would measure whether whether we considered something real, or at least one way. Um, you know, is there is is there in, is what you are observing being informed by information that comes from outside the brain, or is it entirely internally generated? So, you know, the dream world, for example, is is not is equal is as real as the waking world, uh, except it's not informed by um, sensory information. So we say actually, it's not really happening. If you're doing something in your dream, it didn't. If you kill someone in your dream, it didn't really happen. Um, the experience was exactly the same as if you had done it in real life. The difference, though, is that it wasn't informed by, by sensory in, in information. Um, so if you're going to ask, is the DMT world real? What you need to ask really is, is it solely constructed by your brain or is it constructed by your brain, modulated by, constrained by, informed by information coming from some other place? And that's really the question hmm. that I'm interested in answering. Hmm. Okay. I have some, I have some like, I mean, possibly critical questions about that, but I want to wait till we get a little bit more into psychedelics and DMT in particular. Um, and as a segue into psychedelics, I'm curious if given like the, you know, the model, <laughs> the, what you've given us so far, where would you explain the experience of meaningfulness coming into play here? Can you explain what you mean by meaningfulness? <laughs> well, the meaningfulness in the sense that it's like... Um, 
Mm, wow, Jesus Christ, man! What'd you do to me? Yeah. Uh, so that's 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 a good question that you flipped it back on me. Let me think about this for a second. Um, like meaning seems to be some experience that is deeply subjective, influenced by the external world, but not consistently, and seems to have a guiding factor for the ongoing construction um, of reality. And I'm wondering, like, where does meaning come into play in the sense that why are some things more or less meaningful? Uh, and of course, that then leans into psychedelics. Why do psychedelics increase a sense of meaning? But I'm curious if you have a definition for meaning yourself, where it comes into play with what you're talking about here. Um, so, okay, there, I, there are a number of ways you can approach meaning, and you can get, I'm not a philosopher. And, and I know that a philosopher might have a very specific definition of meaning. As a neuroscientist, when I think of meaning, I think, I think and this is really comes from a, a neuroscientist called Giulio Tononi, who describes meaning as when the brain goes further um, than, the inf than, the, than the information itself. So, for example, and the, the example he uses, a, um, and I can actually show you maybe, a... Um, uh, no, you can't see it. <laughs> uh, a, a Japanese character, right? Now, if I showed you a Japanese character, um, I sh do you speak Japanese? No, I do not. Okay, good. <laughs> that helps. Genichiwa, so I, you... I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, if I give you, if I show you a Japanese character, we can both look at this Japanese character. Now, to, we'll both see the same image. Um, however, for me, um, I, it will have meaning my brain will go further than the, simply the structure of it, and it will ev evoke things in my head. It might remind me of, I mean, the way that I remember the characters is based upon giving them meaning. And so meaning is something you, you know, I can give to something. Um, so I can see a tree, I can see water, uh, I can see fire, I can see mountains um, embedded within this simple structure, and that gives it meaning. Um, so when you look at something or you experience something, um, I think meaning is when, is when the, the simple structure uh, of, your, of the experience is, is taken further by your, by your brain and added to and, and it's sort of integrated within um, all of your past experiences and, 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 and generate something quite uh, unique for you. Um, you know, if you see a, um, I don't know, uh, if, if, you, if you have a child, for example, um, and you see a photograph of your child or your, your uh, girlfriend or boyfriend, right, that has, might evoke very, very profound meaning to you Whereas to someone else, it would just be another person. They might be cute, they might not be cute. But apart from that, it's not particularly much going on there. And if that person had died in a horrific accident, you know, three weeks before, the meaning and, and the, the emotions are going to be very, very different. So, so that's how I experience meaning. Um, and I guess with, with psychedelics, there seems to be, I think you were kind of alluding to, the, this, this enhancement of meaning or an appreciation of meaning or development of meaning or often conf confrontation with meaning where meaning didn't seem to be there and and if we think about meaning in that in that way as the idea that meaning is when you t the brain goes further with something take goes beyond the the, the information and um, that kind of makes sense because what we know that psychedelics do is that they allow the brain to um, adopt a greater kind of range of, of states. They allow the brain to, to generate more information uh, in different configurations uh, than in the, the normal waking state. So uh, if you read Aldous Huxley, for example, uh, and he describes you know, seeing um, these patterns in fabric or something, uh, and he sees amazingly rich universe of meaning within this. Um, that's because this kind of deep meaning um, is something the brain is constructing for a start. Um, and under normal waking circumstances, it's not particularly helpful to, uh, when, if everything you look at 
uh, imports great meaning because you would never get anything done. Mm -hmm. You would be distracted by everything. You wouldn't be able to attend. So, so this old idea, which has become something of a truism, that the brain is, is largely a, devi a filtering device, um, is certainly true. Um, the brain has to know how to sample information from the environment and, and what to make sense of, what's important. Um, and again, we go back to the idea of an adaptive reality. You know, what's in adaptive, what's functional, what's useful right now, and what isn't. And what psychedelics do is actually they take away that filtering mechanism. Um, so, so you can actually start to appreciate things without the brain kind of cutting off information, saying actually you don't need to worry about that aspect of of the experience. You know, you don't need to worry about um, the fact that uh, this this photograph, um, you know, carries profound and deep meaning for you. You know, but you, you never noticed it before. You know, or the, or the way that the the trees are arranged. Um, you know, it's, it's, things like that that you would never notice before that actually do carry deep meaning for you uh, but you simply ignore it your brain filters it out because you couldn't function in a world where everything was importing you know this profound meaning i guess does that make sense yeah yeah it does and then also um i could see how when psychedelics happen in, in this uh you know d disintegration of normal reality modeling um happens that more information is being allowed in from the extrinsic information as well as more intrinsic yes. information too because exactly. it's yeah. no longer a flower that is pretty and you like pretty flowers. It's a flower that is pretty and it also feels like this temporary expression of beauty which is encapsulated in youth which is also representative of the of the incredibly short timeline of being alive and now it has to do with like the feelings of grief and love and majesty that you know that circle around the life and death of everyone you love and yourself and exactly and, and the universe and the sun will eventually die out and the flower is now Exactly. so much more meaningful than a pretty spring emergence exactly so mm -hmm. you know you start with this image you know you see an image of a flower and under normal circumstances that kind of connects to a number of kind of concepts mm -hmm. um and and that's that's all it is you know is it an edible flower is it uh, not an edible flower is it pretty is it not pretty done whereas when you're on psychedelics as you say that the, the brain is able to absorb more information but also there's an increase in connectivity between many parts of the brain. So you can imagine, you know, you see the flower and it connects to this, connects to that, connects, and it connects to all these ideas, exactly what you've spoken about. And, and they kind of fill consciousness and, and suddenly you're kind of aware and you're overwhelmed with this profound sense of meaning where every, this flower kind of evokes all of these different, these different feelings and all these different ideas and concepts. And, and you can, you know, you, you can understand why that can be quite overwhelming for people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, is there is there anything else specifically that you feel is is relevant or important to talk to mention about psychedelics and their activity in uh, and, and their their function or, or whatever um, insofar as what we're talking about before I ask you specifically about DMT? Well, I think we need to understand what what psychedelics fundamentally do, and 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 this is this is kind of poorly understood by by most people, uh, but what with these, certainly with the the advent of modern imaging techniques, uh, as well as uh, fundamental kind of pharmacological studies that have been going on for decades now, we really do kind of have a much deeper understanding now of exactly what psychedelics are doing. Um, so basically, your brain, as I've said, your brain is 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 a is uh, is always generating patterns of information and these patterns of information are organized by the the structure of the brain the, the the cortex basically the cortex is really the world the major kind of world building part of your brain um, the, the outer layer this kind of folded outer layer of your brain and this is constructed from um, millions and or billions really of these little cells called neurons which are heavily connected with each other and the what these Connections between these neurons uh, allows them to communicate with each other and share information and generate patterns of information. And this is tightly regulated um, under normal circumstances. Um, so there are networks, for example, that are well-established, um, networks that are involved with um, 
introspection, thinking about yourself, networks that are involved in, in um, seeking things in the, in the external world, networks that are involved in solving problem, mathematical problems, for example. And, what, uh, and these networks don't really speak to each other. So the brain is very, very well organized. And so it tends to generate certain patterns of information, often called a repertoire of states. And what psychedelics do uh, through mechanisms that are quite complex and we won't go into, but what psychedelics do is they kind of loosen all of that. They, they break down the integrity of these well-established networks and they allow networks to start to sort of disintegrate, but then also to start speaking with each other. And so you have these highly regulated separated network that suddenly break down and suddenly start communicating and so the world literally goes from being very very stable and predictable and you know exactly what's going to happen next to being in completely stable you're kind of you're 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 you tumble into this highly dynamic and fluid world where nothing is nothing is the same you know nothing seems real in the same way in in, in a sense um yeah so that's what psychedelics are doing that they are they're shifting they're, they're, they're shifting the reality channel slightly out of tune if you like and allowing it, the brain to explore a larger number of states now, dmt of course is a slightly different kettle of fish so to speak all right well let's let's uh <laughs> let's cook this kettle and find out what you're talking about here <laughs> so so yeah so it's so a regular so a normal dose things slightly different when you get to very very you know mega high doses but for regular doses of, of psilocybin mushrooms for example or, or, or lsd you know 100 mics of lsd or two or three dry grams of mushrooms then what you what tends to happen is the world you tend to get a modified version of, 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 con, of the consensus world this world basically this world changes uh, but it's still this world in a, in a way you can still navigate um, it might be a much richer world it's more fluid um, you know, colors are, are brighter and, you know, you feel like it's a very, very different world, but it's still this world fundamentally. Whereas when you smoke DMT or inject DMT, something very, very different happens is that the brain actually seems to undergo uh, what turns mechanical this 100% uh, reality switch where the brain switches uh, within a few seconds, really, from constructing this world um, this model of reality to constructing an entirely different model of reality that bears no relationship to this one. Uh, that is confounding um, and extremely difficult to explain, actually, um, from a neuroscientific perspective, which is why I really became interested in DMT, firstly, from, a, a, from the outside, really, and then having, you know, first experiencing DMT. Um, I, I, I realized that this was not something that was easy to explain. It certainly was just far too facile to say that DMT was just hallucination because the brain, sorry, the world that we experience on normal waking life is, is, a, is a world that the brain has, has evolved and learned to construct over millions of years of evolution and throughout your life as your receiving information from the external world your brain is literally changing its structure to to, to build a, refine a model of the world so your brain knows or should know uh, uh, how to construct only one world and it's this world you know the world that it, it constructs on a day-to-day -day basis or the world that it constructs when you're dreaming that's the world um, so my question is well how on earth does the brain know how to construct this highly complex um, world the bizarre alien reality of crystalline clarity you know, how does it achieve this um, without having having kind of evolved or learned to construct it unless there is some kind of information input into the brain that's directing this in the same way that information from the normal waking world you know, directs the construction of your world in, in daily life Hmm. What I mean, like, could could it not just be the result of the of the same mechanisms that construct the reality that we live in, that's fed by intrinsic information, just being flipped on its head and just being made into something entirely different? I mean, what what particular evidence, other than subjective meaningfulness um, or some sort of like continuity of people speaking about? you know, the similarities of the experience, what kind of evidence do you have to support that the things that you're interacting with in there have some sort of agency that's external to your own, like, intergenerated reality? Mm. Well, that, that's, this is really, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, I mean, 
we, as I've said, you know, worlds are always constructed by the brain, and, and the DMT world is also constructed by your brain. So the question is, you know, is there is is there some external place outside of the brain from which information is entering the brain that's, that's guiding the structure of this DMT space? Now, I have no explanation um, from an, from a kind of orthodox neuroscientific perspective of how um, or why when you when you uh, um, introduce DMT into the brain, why it suddenly starts constructing a world that of a very characteristic nature. Um, it, it's not pure chaos or just a maelstrom of, of confusion. And, and uh, you know, you're not, you, you, you enter a very, very characteristic place. And there's, there's, there, I, there's very little explanation for that um, because you know, the brain as a default, tends to want to construct this world. This is the world that it normally constructs. It's the world that the brain, only world the brain knows how to uh, to construct or should know. And so, when you introduce a DMT, which kind of you know shifts the, the radio dial basically out of tune, why why do you you know uh, why does the brain start constructing this this you know this this incredibly complex uh, hyperdimensional reality replete with extremely intelligent beings that, that try and attempt to communicate with you and why do people describe the same types of beings and describe the same types of places um, that's confounding that that is very difficult to explain if if you understand you know how the brain builds realities if you if you appreciate that that it, it makes it more difficult in my opinion as a neuroscientist to actually explain it um, which is why I don't take the, the kind of the the path of least resistance as most neuroscientists do and say, well, it is just hallucination. I, I will say, okay, I'm going to take this seriously and, and say, okay, what if this place really does exist uh, independently, autonomously? There are what if there are entities within this space that have their own subjective consciousness that are as real, you know who are equally, as I always say, are as, as unable to deny their own existence as we are unable to deny our own existence. Mm. Um, so these, these, have, these are really real. In the set, they, they, they exist from their own side. Um, I take that kind of seriously. And I think people have to, some people have to. I think you have to be, even if you are you know, working, working within the scientific arena, I think there has to be certain kind of contrarians, I guess, who actually say, actually, let's take this seriously. What are the consequences of taking this seriously? What what does it mean? You know, how would we explain it if they if these entities did exist and and this world uh, was autonomous? You know, how can we think? You know, you trying to keep one foot within the scientific arena? Uh, how we uh, are we able to actually explain what might be going on? Um, and and that is basically the what I, I'm, I'm thinking about these days, and this is what my book is all about, is trying to actually t provide a, a mechanism, a kind of coherent narrative, worldview, if you like, um, that actually explains how DMT might fit into this worldview and might act as this um, gate for information from uh, places that we had no idea existed. Hmm. Now, you know, I, I respect the ability to ask yourself seriously, what if, because um, mm. I think that's an important contribution to the larger scientific exploration, as well as the larger question of, of you know, like, the, the, curi the curiosity that guides us through the mystery of being alive, which makes us uniquely and interestingly human. Um, and at the same time, I, I mean... It doesn't seem to me like to to say to a fairly that that it doesn't seem to me, mind you, I'm less educated on on this information theory and the neurobiology, that the brain, although it's you know very good at constructing this reality, the one that enables us to have this conversation, that it's also just generally really good at constructing some kind of reality and some kind of meaning and some kind of pattern of something, that DMT might come in and just completely scramble the signal and as a consequence of that the brain just generates something consistent something consistent in a way that seems impossible a lot of the times and it might you know generate you know continuities of things because dmt is generally doing the same thing to brains that are generally the same but none of that necessarily means that what is being 
what the general uh, phenomenon is is as is evidence that that general phenomenon is a is an extrinsic reality uh, that is that is beyond our own. Yes, I mean you, you're you're right, but you, what you I guess you have to be careful, James, in that there's a lot of assumptions that you're actually making in that statement, mm-hmm. and and, the, and 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 it's the same assumptions that other you know the neuroscientists and psychologists would make they would say okay yeah you 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 distort the signal you jam the signal or whatever and the, and the brain tries to make sense of it uh, in some way and, and creates a, a world and i i think the brain does try i think the brain is um has this drive this in, inherent drive to, to self-organize and that's really important it's, it's self-organized and tries to construct a coherent reality uh, but why that 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 coherent reality would take the form that it does um, con- consistently, um, I think, is very difficult to explain. And why DMT specifically would have this uh, characteristic effect uh, in in generating this very very characteristic world that that happened, you know, you know, it's hard to explain why the brain would construct a reality that was filled with, uh, you know, powerful and intelligent beings. Um, you know, amorphous beings of light, or reptilians, or or insectoids, or all these kind of other part of this kind of diverse, hyperdimensional kind of ecology of beings. Uh, I I I think that's one assumption too far. I think, and I think if you assume that that's the case, it's just the brain trying to make sense of of, of chaotic information, which is kind of what I call the, the James Kent approach, uh, which is kind of is 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 actually quite dismissive. And if you, if you're wrong, how are you ever going to know, James? <laughs> right? If Wait, you're wrong about me that. or him? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, you what know, I mean? Yeah. I'm. Generally. You know, like I can, I can, I can, I can respect that. And, and in some ways, you know, like I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. Although I do think yeah. it's, it's a fairly reasonable argument to make, and is a common one. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And another yeah. one might be, okay, well, why, why is it constructing reptilians, beings of light? whatever well because we have models and we have models that pre, that sort of preemptively uh establish themselves in order to make sense of an experience and the vast majority of information coming in about the you know the phenomenological topography of the dmt realm is coming from people who are smoking it as a consequence of being inspired to smoke it based on the things they're reading on the internet and could it not be suggested that it's not that an extrinsic reality is being encountered but that the like the pre-established models for what might happen due to the popularity of certain you know, descriptions of experience in the subculture is emerging um, to make sense of chaos. Okay, so there's a couple of points there, and and these are really good good points. And and you're absolutely right that the the cultural effect, this um, this kind of cultural bias uh, of, of 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 knowing what kind of experience you're expecting, and and having you know listened to Terence McKenna talk about machine elves. Mm-hmm. One, it's very easy then to say, okay, well, that's why you, you, you saw machine elves or elves of some sort, because Terence McKenna told you about them. Um, and that it's a difficult problem, and it, it, it's it's very difficult to get away from that kind of confounder. Um, um, but so really, this is something that myself and, and Dave Luke of, of Greenwich University, we actually thought, well, let's go, go pre-McKenna, the pre-McKenna era, uh, and actually start to look at, experiences before the the, the explosion of, of interest the modern kind of explosion and in interest in, in DMT um, so we're talking about going back to the 50s really from the very very early earlier studies mm. um, and, and 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 you will you are you will notice commonalities between the experiences of, of these very very these are the first people ever really to, to receive um, pure DMT and there certainly wasn't uh, um, you know, fanzines that, or any kind of communication between them. There was no kind of cultural impact, mm-hmm. uh, DMT, you know, that, that, that they could have shared. Uh, and yet they, they, they experienced the same kind of things. They experienced godlike creatures. They experienced small, lively creatures that, that looked like dwarves moving around quickly. Uh, this came from actually one of the earliest studies, I think it was 1956, um, but literally one of the very first studies with DMT, a subject described seeing little 
um, small small dwarf-like creatures moving around quickly, which I regard as the world's first um, machine elf experience. Um, <laughs> so you so you can do things like that. You can think of a ways around it. Unfortunately, these early studies didn't weren't so interested in the, the content of people. They just kind of often recorded them as hallucinations. So mm-hmm. the actual detailed kind of trip reports are kind of lacking. Uh, so that is kind of a problem. Um, I, I'll admit that. Um, but I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm-hmm. throw the elf out with the bathwater uh, in this regard, because I think you know, it's, 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 it's a problem. Um, and it, but, it, but it doesn't mean that we, we have to just dismiss and say, okay, we, 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 there's no way we can ever make sense of people's trip reports because they're, uh, they're always confounded by, by what they read. Um, and that's not always true, of course. Um, people, people do enter the, do, do smoke DMT without having had that input. Um, and there are experiments you can do. We have it, we have proposed, um, experiments where you would get to go to a, a DMT naive culture. Uh, and, and inject them with DMT and then record their trip reports mm. uh, and see what they experience. That would be cool. Uh, I mean, how you'd get the permissions and funding to do that. But you can imagine going to a, a culture that had no access. Uh, you would probably have to be some kind of tribal culture or something. Well, see, now there, no, there you get into you get into <laughs> another sort of quandary because, mm. you know, I, I mean, and this is something that to me, I think um, – Although I'm not much of a traditionalist, I think his historical historical presence um, is a type of supportive evidence in and of itself. And essentially, other than the modern Western world, basically every other culture that we know exists also believed in some sense of there being spirits, some sort of relationship to animism mm-hmm. or what have you. And so, if there's a if there's a common phenomenological um, emergence of a sense of sentient intelligence beyond mm. oneself present when high on the DMT, uh, and you give that to a culture of people who are already predisposed to experience or believe in, you know, spiritual beings that exist in you know, that exist in our reality but can't be seen or necessarily contacted outside of ceremonial context, that they're likely going to interpret it um, in that way anyways. And then you might end up giving yourself a false positive because you end up seeing spirits or entities, uh, but you were going to see them anyways because they had another type of predictive model. So not to say that that totally removes mm-hmm. the concept, but yeah, that yeah, is yeah, another yeah. quandary. Yeah, of course. And, and it also kind of raises the question of, do we have this sense of intelligence beyond ourselves as, as some kind of deeply held, deeply rooted delusion, you know, kind of a, perhaps a Richard Dawkins interpretation of it? Or is it because actually it does fundamentally represent some um, implicit um, latent sense that we actually we do really know that we act, somehow we kind of understand that there is this intelligence and yet we, we don't quite know why we understand this or why we know this. Um, that could be true as well. You know, are elves part of Celtic folklore? Um, you know, do we see elves? Um, let me frame that differently. Do people see elves on, on the DMT because they're aware of elves in Celtic folklore or are, elves part of celtic folklore because people have experienced them mm-hmm. now not necessarily with dmt but through some other way of removing or shifting um the, the filters of, of reality in some way tuning right. the channel right. in some way well that so becomes like a chicken and the egg argument exactly too, right? what i was going to say yeah. yeah it's chicken and egg argument so so it's, it's 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 always tricky and it's a difficult path to um to traverse for sure um, but that doesn't mean we should give up or we should just throw it into this epistemic black hole and say, oh, we, we can never know anything about it um, or it's all just hallucination. And that's so lovely and it's you know, neatly packaged away and we can kind of uh, wash our hands and get back to more important things in life, perhaps. Mm. Um, but actually, no, I think it's, it's the, mis- the, the things that are actually most difficult to, to get a grip grip on it, the, the, the slipperiest things and the, the most mysterious things that are actually uh, often the most interesting and so that's 
yeah, that's why I think we shouldn't just dismiss the machine elf or the uh, the insectoid reptilian beast, you know. And um, I think uh, I think we have to approach them at least with the same kind of respect as you would approach um, someone you met in a forest um, or a being that you met that came from a, a, a shimmering metallic disc that was kind of humming in your uh, in your back backyard mm -hmm. uh, you know how would you approach them would you assume that they weren't real or would you uh, you would you try and communicate perhaps if you get over the, the shock um, you might try and okay look, what, what what can they tell me you know what kind of information you know how can I communicate how can I establish stable communication with them and that's kind of been my approach you know I'm I've never been one to say the DMT world is real um, it exists independently and these beings are real what I'm kind of saying is actually Let's approach this this space, the DMT space, as if they could be, uh, and then think, well, how would we interact with them then? You know, would we just burst into their space for five minutes, look around wide-eyed, and then disappear, um, or would you actually try to be a bit more respectful to go in there, spend some time there, and try and establish communication with them, try and establish communication with a select number of, of these entities. Uh, and well, say, this, does, okay. this, does, <clears throat> this does come with the assumption that they are real and extrinsic in order to, to even ask the question of like, what if I approach it with respect and ask questions, it does come with that assumption or, or um, hypothesis that yes. they are they have that that agency that you're interacting with. And I, I got to yes. say, like, I really do respect, uh, very much respect your approach of like, it, it doesn't make sense to just throw this away as hallucination by any means. There's too much evidence that something is happening for us to be like, well, it's really actually just nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And also at the same time, I'm not, well, I, I want to get here in a second. I'm not entirely on board. You know, I'm much more agnostic curious and waiting for people like yourself to come back with more data for me to to make the assessment yeah, you know that's perfect um, yeah and but i have one more question because i do want to ask you about okay so then what if and what do you think um but i have one more question because dmt is extremely fucking weird right and yes there's some commonalities we'll say core commonalities intelligent entities impossible spaces complex structures this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But then there are things that are that are very unique to the person. Uh, riding on rainbows or, 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 you know, interacting with the god Isis or like, you know, being <laughs> swallowed by a dragon or something like this. How do you think there, what, what are your thoughts on being able to differentiate? Like what of this is actually just straight up a hallucination in the sense that no, 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 you were not riding on a, you were not riding on a rainbow, but you were perhaps interacting with an entity. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So, so again, we have to kind of refer back to the original point about what the what what's happening when you're experiencing a world. You know, the brain is always trying to is, the brain is always building a model. Uh, and as you as you say, you mentioned Don Hoffman's work. This idea that when you when you look at your the desktop on your computer and you see the, the trash can and you drag a file to it, that's not really happening. You know, yeah. the file isn't moving to a little trash can. Actually, there's some electronics going on between that. Uh, and this is because this this computer is set up with a with a very very efficient and effective model that works. When you're in the DMT state, even if you are receiving information from this higher dimensional space, the brain still has to build a model. It's not like just because this DMT space exists, let's assume, uh, and that it, the information from it can be received by the brain. The brain still has to construct a model uh, and make sense of it. Um, and, you know, the, the world that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, normal waking world, your brain has, has, has had millions of years, really, uh, to evolve uh, and all of your life to develop and learn how to construct this model of reality it does it pretty well so it's perhaps not too surprising when you enter the dmt space that the brain is going to construct a model that is pretty being, um uh, you know pretty testy and, and perhaps you know pretty fragmented and, and constantly trained shifting and the brain is constantly trying to construct a, a coherent model um with with extremely strange and in information that it's receiving um so so i'm not surprised that that 
that when people go, go into the DMT space, that it's often highly variable, highly influenced by, um, you know, their own cognitive and their own psychological makeup and their own structure of their own brains even. Uh, and that even applies in the normal waking world to an extent, but to a much less obvious extent. Um, so I think, as you point out, you know, it's the, the, the intelligence, I think, these kind of focal points of intelligence that is really important. The actual form of them as you see them, oh, they look like reptiles. I don't think that's as significant. Mm. Uh, or they look like insectoids, um, or they kind of seem like this or that. I don't think that's I don't think that's any more important, for example, than the um, the trash can on the desktop on your computer, whether that's, you know, the size or the color of that, for example, or the form of that, or whether you're using a Windows machine or a Mac. Um, that doesn't matter. The point is what's going on behind that. You know, what is that information? And is that information, is, is that some kind of conscious um, entity that has a, you know, a subjective awareness? And that's the important point, I think, mm. not the outward um, outward form, which I think could be variable. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. I think you need to focus on the intelligence and, and perhaps what information you can glean from that intelligence. Okay, okay, cool. So then let's let's move forward, you know, um, uh, with the, the hypothesis that there is the intelligence. It's extrinsic. We can interact with it. Um, maybe give me that sort of like Give me the larger picture of your what if and what you're wondering about. So if, okay, so if that is the case, DMT is an extrinsic, or DMT provides access to an extrinsic reality. Mm. Where does that, where does that, um, how do you, where do you place us in this reality yeah. um, in relationship to that? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is. So this is perhaps, you know, the, the idea that there is there is an, an alternate reality. Uh, you know, some might call it a parallel universe or an you know other dimensions of reality is not in itself the most shocking thing. Um, you know, even the most conservative physicists would struggle to rule out the idea that there are you know parallel universes or part of you know a multiverse. And there might be very very intelligent, extremely strange beings existent uh, in these kind of places. That's not the most shocking revelation. The most shocking revelation about DMT is that this this place can be accessed hmm. um, with su such facility. You know, inhaling a couple of lungfuls of the, one of the simplest plant alkaloids uh, in the world, um, and you can go there within within a few seconds. That's the most startling thing. If that's what's really happening, and that then, you know, if you if you take seriously the idea that th this is an extrinsic reality, then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the, I call this the data input problem. How does information get from that space to um, this thing in my head that's constructing my, my, my reality? And that's really what uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about over the last few years and, and, and developing my kind of model for how this might work, for how, um, DMT changes the information being generated by the brain in a very profound way that um, gates information from these kind of orthogonal um, dimensions of, of reality, this higher dimensional system. So we're kind of, it's, uh, you, one can imagine living in a flatland world, like, like on a chessboard, um, a two-dimensional world, and then suddenly receiving information from the third dimension. Um, and that the information generated in that 2D slice of reality can somehow gate information from this high dimensional system. And, and, and in the book, I spend a lot of time explaining um, using a kind of simplified kind of model system that I use for kind of more for, for explanatory purposes uh, to kind of explain how that might work uh, and that the DMT might be doing more than just changing the information generated by your brain, but actually changing it in highly characteristic way that allows it to receive information from um, places toward from which it normally has uh, to which it normally has no access, basically. So, so it places us uh, in this um, 
you know, a, a quote I used at the start of the book from Terence McKenna, the main thing to understand is that, in, is that we are imprisoned in some kind of work of art. I see us as being um, imprisoned, it's perhaps not quite the right word, um, but locked within, held within this lower dimensional slice of, of reality. Um, and, and that's a, a great revelation that, that, that there are other places that exist Again, as Terence McKenna used to say, one quantum away, you know, um, and right here, right now, and uh, and, and that this place is replete with uh, this extreme levels of intelligence, um, and that we can access it, and that we can actually become a part, ultimately, perhaps part of that reality, and that is perhaps the ultimate destiny of of. of, of species that reach a certain level of cognitive sophistication. Um, I, I describe DMT as being this uh, intelligence test, uh, a, 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 a basically a, a message that's embedded in our reality and that is essentially waiting for an intelligence with a, the requisite level of, of cognitive sophistication and technological acumen to actually isolate it and, and decode the message, i.e. isolate DMT, understand what it is and learn to use it, uh, and then to gain access to this um, hyperdimensional system uh, mm. of, of which we are only a, a thin sliver, uh, and then ultimately to actually become interdimensional citizens of hyperspace. You know, that would be the ultimate goal here. Mm. Um, you know, we leap over galactic citizenship um, and actually become part of this higher hyperdimensional system that i you know i'm thinking i mean it sounds like science fiction for sure well, it, it actually <laughs> it, really, it really does like as i'm listening yeah. i'm i'm I, honestly i'm hearing this and this isn't necessarily to completely delegitimize or anything but you know i'm hearing it and i'm like this kind of sounds like a sci-fi iteration of the redemptive story of christianity you know and i'm like i maybe this is you know yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, okay, well, you just have to engage something in a certain way and be a good enough person. You're talking about cognitive sophistication, but Christianity is more like moral sophistication. Of course, yeah. there's very yeah. different structures here. And you get entered into as a citizen of the kingdom of God, and you're talking about becoming citizens of a hyperdimensional reality or something. Yeah. I mean, to me, yeah. it, it does really sound like a modern sci-fi iteration of an old religious model that may or may not be rooted in something, you know, mm. deeper than than that religious model. But then at the same time, this might also be, you know, well, now I don't mean to delegitimize, but possibly it is just, you know, a, a construct that you're building in your head that doesn't actually represent an extrinsic reality. However, it seems that you're it seems that you're mindful that you're also letting yourself become very excitedly speculative. Um, oh yeah, as well. So, but I just oh, want, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I kind of felt that I was like, whoa, this feels really familiar to something yeah. I learned when I was little, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's the first time anyone's pointed that out. And I, I, I kind of, I kind of agree in, in this idea of redemption or the idea, I think what's slightly different, uh, and again, as you point out, is that there's not this idea of being good or, or bad. It's, it's a, it's a technological, it's basically any species that emerges with a certain this requisite level of intelligence can basically pass this test. This is why I call it a game, mm. I, and and and, it, and it's a game. Um, it's not a um, some um, great moral journey. There's no great moral imperative here. It's not. You're not going to go to hell uh, if you if you don't complete the game. And and the idea is that it is a game. It's not work. It is recognizing that life itself is um, is a game. Um, and and I think we should never lose sight of that. And and I think we get we get we get ourselves into a lot of trouble uh, when we start to take life too seriously. Uh, um, but perhaps it's a it's a type of game perhaps that most people haven't imagined. Hmm. Um, and actually, the game is perhaps far stranger um, than than most people have ever considered. Um, and the name of the game is perhaps much bigger than people most people have ever considered more uh, stranger more complex um more incomprehensible well let me and ask the, you a yeah. question here okay so and, yeah. and i'm sorry i'm interrupting you because like it's i got fine. i the thing about the game i think that's interesting to consider and sometimes i i you know the, this is just a part of maybe my spiritual practice or my model is just to be like whoa, whoa, whoa. ultimately life is and i'm here for a time and then it's going to be over and then i'm going to experience something else possibly the the complete 
obliteration of all that I once thought was is until there's nothing or possibly Mm -hmm. some other something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that game can be good. I mean, help not to take life too seriously, but also there's, I think there's a risk there of not taking it seriously enough. And I wonder about something, and this goes back to the sort of like, you know, the the connection to the redemptive story of, of Christianity and, and many other, well, every other Abrahamic religion, I guess, except for maybe Judaism. Um, but it's like, what is so bad about human life that leads us to need to escape to another dimension? You know, if we, what if, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to like throw this out there to sort of contradict your game thing um, or to or to disrupt the the narrative which is like what if the game is to is testing you about whether or not you'll let yourself yourself get distracted by dmt and not take seriously what if the game is actually can you not fall into the trap of distraction and take very seriously the true humanness of being alive on this incredible planet and the importance of taking care of it i mean it's great that we can trip dmt and go places but is it more important than doing our absolute best to, you know, like to reverse climate change and protect the planet from extinction. I mean, like, how do you wrestle with these other very real troubles that we're facing in this very real life? Or, or, sorry, excuse me. These very serious troubles that we're facing um, in this in this baseline reality that is the most adaptive for us to currently be living in with the current construct of our brains. Um, and the potential wonders and possibilities of this of this dimension of reality that we have um, with the idea of what could just be an attempt at escaping into another reality. Yeah, I don't think that just because um, you know, if, if my vision of this game is correct, that means that human life is somehow um, less important, you know, as any more than... Um, the you know the early stages the opening gambit of a chess game is less important than than the checkmate you know they're they're they're, they're both part of the same the paint same structure they're both part of the same game and and I think you know life I think is 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 play is pl- playfulness and uh, and and I, I just see it, see it as uh, you know one way in which um, whatever it is, whatever is the kind of the fundamental reality expresses itself is through creating, creating reality. I think the Hindus got closer to it than anybody else with the idea of Brahman, you know, playing at making the worlds, which he then sort of destroys um, and then starts again, you know, and, and does that forever and ever and, and just takes great joy and pleasure in, in creating worlds within which he wanders and gets lost of all, all these different things and uh, i think alan watts expresses these ideas beautifully uh, more beautifully than anybody else i think um but uh, you know that's kind of i always that's always the backdrop from for my thinking i don't um i don't see that human existence on this is something that should be dismissed or that's something we need to escape from um i don't but but I think it's all part of one ongoing game, and and the game is okay. We're we're embedded within this lower dimensional slice of reality. Actually, we can we can we can access and become part of a high dimensional system, which is inf- actually you know far more complex and far richer um, than than this reality. Um, I'm not saying everyone needs to play the game. Um, well, everyone is in a sense playing the game. But then um, see that then there's that that same like. You know, like, I don't need to, okay, I'm not saying that you're saying this, but it, it, inside of this logic, it would not be too far. It would not be a stretch for me to say, well, I mean, this is just a big game in order to, you know, maybe enter us into a higher dimensional reality. So I don't actually need to worry about climate change. I need to worry about accessing the hyperdimensional realms. I don't need to worry about pollution because I am working towards being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And my, I'm, I'm just a passerby on my, my way to God, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. inside of this game, I mean, mm. what about climate change? What about well, political authoritarianism? What about, you know, what about human relationships, family? What about all these other things? Are all of these things now secondary or less important to no, the accomplishment of entering the hyperspace? No, not at all. I mean, we, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's true at all. I, I certainly don't think, I mean, this is this kind of, 
a Christian fundamentalist idea that you kind of uh, you kind of hinted at there. This idea that yeah, they that they're aiming for they don't give, they don't give a fuck about Many of the them, world. Yeah. Be- yeah. yeah, because they're they're literally waiting for the rapture, uh, and it could happen any time, right? They're always expecting it, um, and and. That's not the attitude that I'm taking here at all. I don't. I don't think at all. I think I'm. I, I, I see this reality. I see the a reality on this as being extremely and just a beautiful expression of um, the creation of worlds. And you know, we find ourselves emergent within this incredibly beautiful reality. And if that's as far as it goes, uh, if we only get a peek um, at the, you know, the world beyond this. Um, that's good enough. Ultimately, this world is going to be destroyed. Uh, we have to accept that. Um, you know, in a few billion years, this world will, it will be destroyed. You know, um, Shiva will dance the the Tandara dance and uh, the Tandava dance, whatever it's called. A few billion worlds, <laughs> a few billion years is all right, man. I'm kind of hoping. I'm like trying to you know avoid I mean? 150 years. You know, like so, so, yeah. So you can't. It's not like you're fighting against um, um, destruction versus permanent heaven on earth because that's not real either but of course we should i mean but if you have some if you believe in empathy and you believe in 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 love in a kind of fundamental sense uh, which uh, which i think most most humans really do then then there is a natural you don't have to in a sense you don't have to justify why you care about um the oceans filling with plastic and marine creatures suffering or or, or people dying from starvation or lack of water. That's or a million not something species going to... extinct. Right, exactly. It's not something, you, in a sense, you have to justify and think, oh, well, that's less important than this. It's like, <sighs> it's. I guess it got, how can I explain it? There was a, there's a, an old adage, a kind of a Zen, um, uh, a, a kind of a Zen little um, little story, adage. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a, there's a, a, uh, a, a Christian uh, walks past the river and he sees a guy drowning uh, and he, he, he jumps in the water and he saves him and, and, and the guy, his friend says to him why did he save him and he says uh, because um, I want to get to heaven um, then um, a, a Hindu walks uh, by in the river and he sees a guy drowning he jumps in the water and he saves him and he goes why did you um, why did you or a Buddhist or something um, no a Hindu and so why did you save him he says well because I want to earn merit uh, because it will increase my karma for my next life then the Zen monk walks past the river um, and um, he saves him and he says why did you save him and he says I, I saved him you know it's, it, there was no rationality for it it, it, it's like his origin, his his fundamental nature is to do that, and he, he doesn't say he doesn't do it for a particular purpose. Um, he does it because it's his fundamental. You know, it's it's, it's something that he, he the, the the flow of, of his existence. You know, that's what he does. You see suffering, you you try and you help, you try and ease that suffering. You know, and and I, I think if you kind of expand that in a. Um, Kind of a global view you know that's that's it's, it seems natural that if, if, there are, if there's suffering and, and awful things going on in the world uh, and species going extinct and etc etc and all these kind of suffering and pain then it seems we would naturally care about these things and, and do things whether or not um, um, you know believing this is, is a game doesn't kind of negate the idea of empathy and love at all um, it just it, it's really it's, it's kind of a different thing mm-hmm. and also this this is an incredibly complex difficult question that yeah. i have you and i and I, oh. I completely appreciate that um and i mean the the you know a lot of the reasoning behind my question is really informed by this of course you know this is a curious topic and like i said i i i respect and appreciate the intention to hey we let's some of us at least need to think about this and really take it seriously and explore it and come back with something you know for the larger world to chew on or maybe just for ourselves or something but i also think it's very important that we don't fall into spiritual bypassing when the when the reality we're in right now is calling on us to be responsible and to show up um in a way beyond our own sort of maybe egoic or selfish efforts to transcend or whatever it might be 
Um, and I, I can I can hear you also have an inf- an infusion of like, well, let's keep in mind the responsibilities of, of this world while we also, you know, get curious about what the ending of the game might be. Um, oh yeah. And unless you want to comment on that further, I, I have uh, sort of one last set of questions slash maybe it's just one question. Um, did you want to comment any more before we move on? I think we should. We can move on. I think. Okay. Uh, so you and Rick Strassman. Uh, developed yeah. the uh, extended state DMT infusion protocol, uh, from which I I understand is uh, is going to be happening at Imperial College under under Christopher Timmerman at some point in time in the future, um, and w- and in, you know explain in more detail of course, but what it proposes is that you could put someone under a peak DMT trip, very different than ayahuasca, which is a blend of two different molecules that that allows a DMT like experience a DMT experience at a very low level of DMT in the blood. Mm-hmm. We're talking about pure DMT peak concentrations in the blood for more than the, you know, f- sort of five to eight minute peak, but they could be in that peak for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, days even. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's the curiosity. Now I, as- w- I guess why, um, and what do you hope to achieve? And um, yeah, basically why and, and what do you hope to achieve? Yeah, so so again, you know, earlier I was saying that, okay, so the why question will depend upon who, who, who you're asking. If you're asking me, which you obviously are, yeah. uh, I'll give a slightly different answer than, than Chris Timmerman or Robin Carr-Harris would, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I can guarantee that. Um, so, so you know, if you asked uh, Robin Carhart Harris uh, why, uh, he would say, well, because um, I want to put someone in an F- um, uh, MRI machine for 30 minutes or whatever, or 45 minutes, and get people to do tasks under a low-level DMT experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, using a, a standard bolus injection um, isn't good enough because, you know, it, it's, yeah. as you say, it rises and falls in the brain very, very rapidly. So there's a good explanation um there's also a therapeutic idea the idea that you can bring someone into a low level dmt state uh, and um, effect some kind of psychotherapeutic outcome use it as in a, as, as a in a therapeutic context like that and this is something that rick strasman suggested and then there's me <laughs> um, <laughs> who operates from a slightly different angle as you may have uh, worked out by now yeah <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> But I, I, as I said earlier, I, I take the idea sincerely um, that um, these beings might have an extrinsic existence. And if so, uh, I believe that we should bring our best tools to the table in attempting to establish stable communication with them. Um, that's my bottom line here. I think if, if these beings are real, uh, we should treat them as they, they might well be. Uh, and if we want to communicate with them, learn to communicate with them, then we need to do better than bursting into their space for five minutes and then pissing off again. Hmm. Um, and so this original, the idea of this extended state was that we could achieve that. Um, people talk about ayahuasca, which you mentioned, and as you rightly pointed out, peak levels of ayahuasca in the brain reach about 20% of what they reach uh, with a breakthrough DMT trip, so it's you know it's about a fifth, so you know it's very different, and it's also it's, again it's an up and down thing with ayahuasca. Um, it's 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 drawn out, sure, uh, but it's still not well controlled, and of course it's accompanied by violent purging and all that kind of thing. So this is a this extended state DMT technology is drawing from anesthesiology, uh, the aim of which is to um, it's called target controlled intravenous. Uh, in continuous intravenous infusion, where the target is the brain, or the concentration of drug in the brain. And when you put someone in, under an general anesthesia and you want to keep them asleep for unconscious for a period of time, you want to push the level of the drug into the brain using an infusion and keep it there at a, a fairly constant level. You can push them deeper uh, by raising the concentration. If you need to do, you know, you're making a cut, for example, you want to bring them out slightly lower, um, not so they wake up, but so that they're the, you know the their spiritual system doesn't suffer that kind of thing. Is this, so, wait, is so, this a live modeling? Are you are you live monitoring monitor, monitoring Jesus uh, these these uh, levels or is no. this just this is just mathematical? 
like this is right. this is a mathematical algorithm that you've that you've programmed that makes the assumption Precisely. essentially educated yeah, assumption. So what, yeah. So what you do is you you so initially to develop the model you need blood you do need this sampling data. So you would um, have a, a, normally quite a large number of people who would administer the drug and then you would take blood samples every five minutes, let's say, over time or every 30 minutes, depending on the type of drug. Uh, and then you would get a, a plot, a plot of the blood concentration over time. And then you use that to fit a mathematical model called a pharmacokinetic model, which takes into account where the drug is going in the body, how it's distributing with various tissues and all this kind of stuff, how it's being removed by enzymatic metabolism, broken down, etc. Um, and then you then you have an idea then of, of what the drug's going to do when you when you deliver it by infusion. Uh, and so that's the idea. So it's informed by real life kind of blood sampling data. But actually, when the, someone's on the operating table, um, you have a programmed infusion rate that you introduce based upon their age and their sex and their weight and things like that uh, and that the idea is then you can without having to take samples which would be completely unfeasible anyway and probably wouldn't give you that much information um, you can you can keep the level of drug in the brain which is the key place where it should be it's not some the concentration in the blood is kind of secondary mm -hmm. uh, it's concentration in the brain of course that's most important um, and so this this you know, there's, a, there's a whole technology, there's a whole um, field of area of anesthesiology that's devoted to this kind of stuff. Um, so it occurred to me that DMT has precisely the properties of these short-acting anesthetic drugs in terms of its pharmacokinetics, in terms of the way it is broken down and distributes in the body and the brain. Um, so I thought, yeah, this, this is the way if you want to push someone into the DMT space for extended periods of time, this approach could work. Um, so this is why I approached Rick Strasman and said, you know, do you have this blood sampling data so that I can develop the model, which he happily provided. Uh, and then I developed this, this mathematical model uh, and we wrote, myself and Rick, we wrote this, this paper, which is basically a kind of a proof of principle mm -hmm. that said that, you know, this technique would work with DMT. Mm -hmm. uh, and we published this in 2015 in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, and yeah. And you're hoping, so, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming your position based on the conversation is that you're hoping that this could enable us or a select few of us to interact with the intelligences of the DMT reality in some way that dot, 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 fill in the blank yes. for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a number of points here. So what we... Normally when people enter the DMT space, first of all, they're normally only there for a few minutes and it, it tends to be quite chaotic and it never kind of stabilizes. And that's not surprising. Um, what I would expect to happen um, or hope to happen uh, when someone can spend perhaps several hours in the DMT space is that, that the brain would, would literally start to learn to construct a more stable model of that reality and actually a more n navigatable if that's a word or navigable show uh, anyway yeah, gotcha. you know what i mean yeah, <laughs> yeah a, a, you know, a, a space that could actually be navigated and perhaps even mapped and that you know a, a communication with specific entities could actually be established hmm. um hmm. then it's like okay we've just established communication and that in itself would be astonishing um then what, what do you do then in that situation? What do you do with that information? What do you do with that, um, that communication that you've established, that relationship that you've established with this, this uh, interdimensional uh, hyper-intelligent being? Um, that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to have experts from various different fields. You're going to have anthropologists. You're going to have mathematicians. You're going to have psychologists. You're going to have chemists and pharmacologists and neuroscientists and um, you name it, linguists, right? Uh, it's like that film. Uh, what was that film called? Ah, uh, uh, like they, they, they were like octopus-type creatures and they were trying to communicate with oh, them. Oh, Arrival. 
Arrival, God yeah. Damn, so <laughs> oh, man. oh yeah, awesome, right? Yeah. So you can imagine that, yeah. But minus the military, yeah, we don't need those. Um, well, I mean, the military is going to be involved, man. <laughs> if you start giving evidence okay, that mate. you're interacting with an alien intelligence, <laughs> shit. I mean, according to Alex Jones, it's already happening. Despite it's already our, happening, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Well, look. So but... I have a, so I, I see where I see where you're going with this, and we are, we're running yeah. limited on time, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do have like some critical questions. Um, one of which, I'll just ask this one very directly, and I'm, it's just come up now, I feel poorly informed on the question, but I'm gonna ask it anyways, which is, you know, I recently read a study about um, scientists giving microdoses of DMT to mice, uh, and that they had suggested that there was some type of brain damage that they noticed afterwards, or some damage to the brain tissue. And I don't know the details on that, maybe you do. And so my question is, okay, so we have that evidence that long duration microdosing of DMT can create damage in the brain. Now, whether or not that damage is something that is subjectively resulting, or subjectively results in a positive change in the person's life, we don't know, because it was mice. But is there a risk of a, some type of brain damage putting somebody under a continuous infusion of DMT over a long period of time? Well, okay, so in terms of the mice study, I, I'd need to, I, I haven't read the original paper. This is some. This is very new, actually. I saw this mm -hmm. in the last few days, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, first of all, you have to be very careful about extrapolating what you're seeing with mice. Uh, of course. And, and with human, of course, yeah. as is always the case. Um, there is, I've not seen any evidence so far um, con that's convinced me that, that any of the classic psychedelics have um, what you would call neurotoxic effects, that is actually direct damaging effects on neurons at all. Uh, in fact, we've seen quite the opposite mm -hmm, uh, with, mm -hmm. with psilocybin, actually an, a yeah. stimulation of, 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 uh, of, of neurogenesis, you know, actual new connections and new neurons, in fact, being, um, being constructed. So, so I would ha I'd have to be convinced that DMT was damaging neurons. Uh, that doesn't mean that, of course, DMT isn't going to, over long periods, isn't going to change the brain. You know, every time the brain receives information, it changes. Every time you learn something, um, you are, your brain is, is, is being changed. Um, and that will, will certainly apply in the presence of DMT. And, and it's, it's a question that a number of people have actually asked. You know, I've done several, quite a few podcasts now, and it's surprising how often this kind of comes up. Not that surprising, maybe. Uh, but the, the idea of, you know, what happens to somebody with, with, uh, if, if they're given DMT over several days, for example, um, their brain essentially starts to learn um, to construct a stable model of reality that bears no relationship to the normal reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at some point, you have to imagine, well, is there going to be a point at which the brain starts to shift uh, and starts to be more comfortable constructing this bizarre hyperdimensional reality um, than it does normal waking reality. Is there a point at which, is there a point of no return? Um, and, which was actually my next question. Yeah, mm, but please continue with that yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so is there a, because, you know, uh, when, as, as, you're, as you're developing, when you, when you emerge screaming uh, from the womb as a baby, instantly you're, you're flooded with information and over years, um, this information sculpts the brain. Uh, the, the brain samples information, it changes the connectivity, it changes the structure. Now with DMT, you're, you're seeing that happen perhaps on a, a contracted time scale. Uh, the brain is flooded with DMT, the brain changes its information, uh, and then it's receiving information perhaps from this high dimensional space, and it's, its structure is changing. It's receiving a completely different type of sensory information, so it's learning to construct a completely different reality. And that involves changing the, these connections the brain is very plastic. It's very good at changing uh, its connections. So there comes a point, perhaps, where the brain, you know, if you, uh, it's hard to say the kind of time scales this would be, but if you were really thinking science fiction and really thinking of putting someone in there for days or weeks, um, then they might actually, their brain might actually kind of switch, you know, this, irre not, not perhaps irreversibly, but difficult to reversibly <laughs> um, switch from constructing the normal waking consensus world as a default, constructing this bizarre alien world as a default. So um, now this leads to another question, right? Because in, <clears throat> in you know, you, you are, you are operating on the, um, on the hypothesis that, that this, you know, reality is extrinsic, the DMT realm, their intelligence there, it's hyperdimensional. The game is how do we get there? Right. Mm -hmm. So, 
say that this person does get there. We'll say one the patients, patients, um, subjects of this research, yeah. they get there. And mm-hmm. then when they come back, well, there's no going back. They're like, like they're, you can come back, but there's, you can't live in the DMT reality anymore. And you come back and, the, and these people are now completely dysfunctional to this world. As far as mm-hmm. anyone else is concerned, you know, they're now psychotic. They can no longer operate in this normal human di- dimension. Did they win the game? <laughs> well, this is <laughs> good point. Right? Yeah, right, right. No, no, you're right. And 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 this is why the, in the book, the game actually does have that finality to it, and there is there is a, a, a an irreversibility to it in that you actually because your the brain is fundamentally an, an information based structure and and the world you experience is, is built from information the idea is that this information can perhaps ultimately be transcribed into this high dimensional space uh, which would mean that you you, you would transfer your consciousness uh, into this space. you would become um, a resident a denizen of, of, of this this hyper dimensional realm and, and so, and so what would that look like then does that look like uh, the person dying during the experience yeah. I would Interesting. So, yeah. And yeah. so then, well, here's a question. Then, I mean, Rick, excuse me, Dr. Strassman um, suggested, you know, based on his own Buddhist belief, which, I mean, there's no actual, as far as I understand, evidence to support that DMT is mm-hmm. released at birth or certain times in the gestation and then at death. Mm-hmm. I mean, possibly we yeah. all win the game by dying. And, and, and so, I, I mean, that's another thing. And I let, I, I actually feel um, remorseful for having interrupted your train of thought there by introducing that. <laughs> because now we're into some, I think we're into some very sticky territory here. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like if somebody comes back and they're broken while well, they failed, and if they die during the experience, objectively, you might recognize that as, oh, okay, good. Well, they won the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean this, this is, this is yeah. some like, yeah, we're into a really touchy yeah. area here, man. Oh yeah, yeah. That's it's it's you're absolutely right. You know, we can never get into their mind, and and um, you know, would there be some technique whereby they could? I mean, presumably, what you would for these extended expeditions, you would establish some way, perhaps, of, of communicating from within the experience, from within the trip um, experience to transmit information. Um, to the people, you know, watching you on the other side, um, and and it, you know, it, would there be a way of, of signalling when this this event, this what I call transcription, actually occurs uh, when you, you finally, you know, reach the other side um, and are gone permanently? Um, I don't know, and it's also possible, of course, and this is slightly even weirder idea, um, since as I said, the brain and, and your conscious world is constructive information it's possible actually of transcribing that into this dmt space and actually returning as you perfectly uh and so in fact you mm. will have mm. both gone and returned mm. so you will come back and be conscious and like okay that was weird something happened and yet also uh, you will also be there still at the same because it's like two copies of um the same data if you make, make sense. And, Interesting. Uh, See, now, yeah. now, now I'm thinking about something else here because similar people talk about alternate realities with salvia, although nobody, mm. as I know, has died from salvia. Um, but people talk about alternate realities with ketamine as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, too, about... And these are both stories that I got from James Kent. I really liked his last 10 episodes of Dose Nation, although I don't necessarily agree with his position a lot of the time. I think they're good contributions to the culture. Um, sure, sure. That, uh, you know, he talked about uh, one woman, I can't remember her name, famous for sort of helping to launch the New Age movement on the West Coast, who was also uh, addicted to ketamine, um, who ended up, who, who believed that, you know, ketamine brought you to this other dimensional reality and that it was like it was a place we needed to go and we were learning there and blah 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 and she ultimately ended up dying because she ran off on her own after her husband was trying to get her to not use ketamine she had a secret stash she runs off on her own in the woods they find her dead with the ketamine around and as far as it looks objectively it looks like she was a ketamine addict and ran off to have her secret dose and was so high on ketamine that she froze to death in the middle of the night you know, like, did she ascend to another dimension? Is it responsible for us to make those claims? As well as the guy from uh, 
the guy who started the brother brotherhood of eternal love who ended yeah. up dying in his tent after possibly having been given maybe bad drugs but as far as they were concerned an extremely high dose of pure psilocybin he ends up dying as a consequence of that while his friends are off tripping elsewhere trusting that he's like in the spiritual dimension and everything's mm-hmm. going to be all right i mean do we say that he succeeded or that he made really bad choices <laughs> like is it is it yeah, i think yeah. that it's a very dangerous slippery line to say that oh well, you know, if you get high enough on DMT for long enough and die, well, you've actually won the game. I mean, that's pretty scary shit, man. It's it's super scary shit. I agree. To I, have I, that I, come I, into the culture, you know. You know, I've, I've you know, and I, I've, I've, I, I don't take this thing lightly. I, I, I think that, you know, what I'm suggesting, I'm certainly not suggesting that anybody should hook themselves up to a machine, start pumping DMT into themselves. You know, this is kind of a, a vision, um, a vision of reality. And and if if it's true, um, and 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 this is really the way it works. This is something that will be discovered in, in increments over time. You know, we're not going to. I'm not suggesting you plug someone into a, a DMT machine essentially and and hold them there for two weeks and wait until they die. No, please <laughs> don't think that's my aim at all. You know, this is not a suicide cult, and it's not a cult at all. At all, it's it's basically it's a vision of reality. It says actually this reality is is fucking strange and it could be far strange than you, than you realize and that um this this kind of vision of reality that i've developed in this book could actually be um the way things are um and i think dmt could provide a uh, a key um that that opens that door the, to kind of some fundamental truth uh, mm. and and uh, is kind of a tool, a technology that we should develop. Um, but that doesn't mean just throwing caution to the wind and you know, casual abandon and just uh, abandoning an all sense of responsibility. Or you know, th- this is uh, not that kind of not that kind of idea at all. It's not the that idea kind of that game. it's not that kind of game. No, no, yeah. it's something that would that would that would emerge and reveal itself um, uh, over an extended period of time. Um, with very very slow increments hmm. in terms of this kind of technology well i you know i, I those are those are those are hard questions again um mm. and i mean quite possibly you know like maybe we do maybe we are welcomed into something absolutely beautiful into an extrinsic reality that is hyper dimensional mm. when we die and it only sucks so horribly for the rest of us left behind because we don't understand that i mean that's that's not yeah. an unreasonable proposition especially if you're thinking about adaptive the adaptive necessity of how we construct a reality that feels a bit nicer but then the other side of that mm. is also true and i really appreciate you taking this very responsible stance at the end here mm. you know in, in response to these questions um i also see this as a really great place to close the interview and uh can you let our listeners know about where they can find out more about your work where they can get your book which i believe is called alien information theory and just generally how to stay abreast uh with your work yeah so so yeah the book alien information theory psychedelic drug technologies and the cosmic game so that's available of course on amazon if you just search for psych- uh, alien information theory on amazon you will find it um, you could also go to my website so if you want to look at the book a few kind of photograph images of the book and the contents uh you can go to my website building uh, and there's a tab there that links to the book and you can order the book directly from there if you like um and there's also links to basically most of my articles and papers that i've written about dmt and, and psychedelics lectures i've given podcasts and interviews um you know a blog so basically yeah that's building alienworlds.com is my uh, is kind of the uh, way you can kind of mine everything I've, I've kind of thought about over the last few years. Uh, and if you want to follow me on social media, on Twitter, I'm Alien Insect, or one word. Uh, and on Instagram, I'm Building Alien Worlds. Uh, those are the ones I use the most to keep kind of in touch with people. Great. Well, uh, I'll make sure that for the listeners who are already familiar, hopefully, that all of those links will be contained at the show notes this episode at jameswjesso.com. Um, okay. And a link to those show notes will be available wherever you're listening to it. Uh, Dr. Andrew Gallenworth, thank you very much for this conversation. Um, thank you. I, I look forward to uh, hearing more about your work and giving your book a read once it comes in the mail. Awesome.
Thank you very much, James. And cut. Oh, wow. Wasn't that fun? It was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. Uh, If you like Dr. Andrew Gallimore, make sure you follow the links that he uh, mentioned there at the end, which will be on jamesavigesso.com for episode 101. You can just head over there. And if it's not on the main page, if this is like some time from now, just search 101 and you will find it. Um, And yeah, if you like the show and you're not already supporting the show financially, go buy a t-shirt, please. You could also buy some art or uh, copies of my books or lectures. Those are all on jamesdvgesso.com forward slash support. Excuse me, I meant shop. Uh, But you could also become my Patreon Patreon or leave a one-time PayPal donation, which uh, you can do by going to jamesdvgesso.com forward slash support. That's it. Uh, see you for episode 102 in about two weeks from this release date, which will be the episode that was originally supposed to come out, um, as 101, which is going to be with R. Coleman, the pseudonym of an underground therapist who has been providing psychedelic therapy for a very, very long time. Another anonymous interview coming up here, uh, on the next episode. So stay tuned, subscribe, and I will see you then. Take care.